Hi, I'm Dr. Randall Seacrees, your host for eOrthopod TV, and today we're talking remotely with Dr. David Mitchell. Dr. Mitchell is an orthopedic spine surgeon who practices in Spartanburg, South Carolina. Dr. Mitchell did his medical school training and his orthopedic residency at the Medical University of South Carolina, and from there also did a spine fellowship at the Indiana Spine Group with Dr. Rick Sasso. Thanks for joining us today, Dr. Mitchell. Thank you very much. Well, Dr. Mitchell, today I thought we would talk a bit about um, a fairly common uh, problem in the elderly primarily, and that is the uh, compression fractures of the spine. And I would like to talk a little bit about your approach to treatment of uh, compression fractures of the spine, a little bit about maybe what causes those compression fractures, how you approach those compression fractures when you see them in your office, and also how you approach the discussion and ultimately the treatment of those uh, uh, compression fractures. Uh, so first, let's start out talking a little bit about compression fractures and why a person might actually suffer a compression fracture of the spine. Thank you, Randall. Uh, the compression fractures of the spine uh, almost always occur in an osteoporotic person. Uh, it can be a man or a woman. Uh, it happens in women sooner than it does men. Uh, based on uh, the hormonal changes. And you, you get a compression fracture uh, because the bone is simply too weak to hold up the weight of the spine and it squashes down much like a uh, marshmallow being squashed from end to end. And what, what are the normal symptoms when this occurs? Uh, uh, what do patients complain about that have compression fractures? The symptoms uh, that they complain of uh, can be uh, absolutely no pain at all, no symptoms, and you only find they have a compression fracture when you're getting an x-ray for another reason, or they could have uh, a debilitating pain that uh, causes them to come to see you in the office or to uh, go to the emergency room because they can't get out of bed and uh, can't uh, walk. And the pain can be so intense uh, that some people do have to be admitted to the hospital. So, so what you're saying is that this is not a compression fracture as we, or a fracture like we would normally sort of think of a fracture as some sort of uh, fairly significant injury or trauma, as we would call it, uh, is usually responsible for causing a compression fracture. So these things just happen on their own, or, or is it resulting from an injury of some type? Almost always these fractures uh, just happen on their own. Uh, they can happen if you were to be osteoporotic and suddenly have a chair slip out from underneath you and you fall down on your buttocks. Uh, but for the most part, uh, every, almost everybody I see, it just happens because the bone just suddenly gives out. And, and we're, we're talking about the spine now. In, in what area of the spine are these most common? Are these most common in the low back, in the, the chest area of the spine, or perhaps in the neck area or the cervical spine? These are almost uh, always either in the low back, the lumbar, are in the uh, mid-back, the thoracic. Uh, very seldom do you see them in the cervical area, and it's, it's more in the uh, weight-bearing uh, lower back or the lower thoracic back. You know, I think that most people who, who hear spine fracture automatically think of problems with the spinal cord and maybe um, paralysis even. Is, is this something that commonly causes any damage to the spinal cord or any any damage to any of the nerves, nerves exiting the spinal cord? Fortunately, it does not. Uh, you, you can't say that 100%, but it's a very, very rare uh, compression fracture that injures any types of nerves or spinal cord. Uh, there uh, is almost no chance of having paralysis. Uh, it's, if it does cause any type of nerve impingement, we sort of classify it as a burst fracture, which is a, a different type of fracture. A compression fracture, by definition, normally uh, does not press on any nerves or the spinal cord. Well, in terms of how these patients actually get in to see you as a spine surgeon, is, is this something a person sort of makes an appointment uh, for and comes in because of nagging pain, or is it something that typically they show up in your office referred by another physician for, from the emergency room, for example, with a fairly significant problem? Typically, they, they're referred into the office uh, either by themselves or by their family doctor. They've, they've gone to see their family doctor for back pain. An x-ray has been taken uh, and maybe even an MRI, and it indicates uh, a compression fracture. And the patient's symptomatic enough that uh, 
they want to have a, a spine doctor see, see their, their patient, so they'll send them to us. Uh, sometimes we get called from the hospital where the patient has been admitted to the hospital because uh, they've had other problems uh, caused by the pain of the compression fracture. Say they had to be admitted just for pain control or they've developed an ileus after taking pain medicines uh, for the pain and it's uh, caused some other problems and so they'll be admitted to the hospital for that. Well, when you're called to consult on one of these patients, whether it's in the, in the hospital or in, in perhaps the emergency room or in your office, they show up in your office with this chronic sort of uh, pain that you're describing. How do you start the process of evaluating what's going on with this patient? We ask them um, either in the hospital or in the office uh, where they hurt and how bad they hurt. And can they uh, move about with the pain? And can the pain be controlled with uh, a, a pain pill? If they answer that the, the pain is only slight and it hurts just a little bit, uh, then we're, we're happy that perhaps this patient won't need any type of surgical intervention. But if they look at you and they, and they tell you that they just cannot stand the pain, they can barely get out of bed, uh, it's hard for them to breathe, then we start thinking, well, uh, maybe this person might be uh, a candidate to have a surgical intervention or perhaps bracing or even changing the pain medicines around. And you mentioned that, that a lot of these patients come to your office already with x-rays or perhaps even an MRI scan. When you're evaluating one of these patients, if you have not seen any type of x-rays or radiologic tests, anything that you typically start with in order to make the diagnosis once you're suspicious of an osteoporos osteoporotic compression fracture? Well, they'll usually point uh, very close to where the fracture is when you ask them where they hurt. Uh, the examination is uh, one that's not very straightforward because these compression fractures give referred pain out into the muscles. Frequently, the, uh, the patient uh, will have a fracture uh, in the upper back and it will be painful a little bit lower. Uh, so you can't go on direct um, examination you certainly want to check and make sure there's no neurologic deficits and um, that's where we start off uh, with the physical exam. So once you've completed your physical exam, what do you like to see in terms of imaging? Is, is the MRI scan something you go immediately to? Do you start with x-rays or, or perhaps any other type of radiologic test? Well, uh, we usually uh, just look at the plain x-rays. Uh, it's almost uh, impossible to tell whether a compression fracture is an old one or a new one and on occasion we'll see a new fracture uh, on top of an old fracture which is uh, even harder to, to see on plane, to tell the difference between on plane x-ray. Uh, so we always use an MRI uh, unless there's a pacemaker involved and we'll have to uh, obtain a CAT scan and a bone scan. But if an MRI uh, has the ability to tell us is it a new fracture or an old fracture. Uh, almost all the time. And what about any additional testing like lab testing or anything? Anything that you like to see in patients that maybe this is their first uh, compression fracture and you're trying to figure out if uh, this is just a one-time occurrence or whether this is related to some other disease process? Well, we, we like to ask them questions and we look at their medical history. If they've been on, uh, if they're younger and they have a compression fracture, and they've been on prednisone every day for the past 10 years, then we know that it's probably a steroid-induced osteoporosis. Uh, we like to ask them uh, in detail about their dietary intake of calcium and vitamin D. Uh, we don't routinely obtain a vitamin D level or calcium level uh, because by the fact that they have a osteoporotic compression fracture, they have osteoporosis no matter what their bone density may say they have osteoporosis if they have a compression fracture. Well, I'm assuming that most of these patients probably have uh, a primary care physician that's monitoring some of that stuff. So a lot of that stuff is probably done by their primary care physician when they're referred. Is, is that accurate? I wish it was accurate. Uh, the primary care doctors have gotten much better about obtaining uh, bone densities and watching for osteoporosis and preaching the virtues of taking vitamin D and calcium uh, but the uh, probably half of my patients uh, don't get that information and uh, or, or feel like they 
don't need to follow those instructions and they uh, simply aren't being protected against osteoporosis. Let's move on and talk a little bit about the decision making around treatment. You had mentioned that, that in some cases this does probably require surgical intervention and you also uh, alluded to the fact that in some cases it may not require anything other than just watchful waiting and there's, there's points in between such as bracing and that sort of stuff. What makes you sort of make that decision uh, to progress on through that continuum of care and what are the points along that continuum? When I'm talking to a patient with a painful osteoporotic compression fracture, uh, we, we talk about the, uh, the natural history and the fact that probably 80% of these will get better on their own given time. And um, we tell them that it's gonna take about six to eight weeks to heal up and you need to have your calcium intake increased and take some vitamin D just to encourage these bones to heal up. Now, if the patient uh, uh, looks at you and says, well, that's great, I think I can handle that. If, if I just have a little pain medicine, I'm doing fine. Uh, we, we see them back the next week to see how they're doing. If they look at you and they said, I just can't take this pain anymore, um, and nothing I take seems to help me with the pain level, uh, then we start considering maybe we ought to start talking about a surgical procedure to, to help them get out of this pain. Well, let's talk a little bit about that surgical procedure. I think it's, uh, you know, the use of surgery for compression fractures uh, in the thoracic spine has had, oh, I don't know, a, a two to three decade long sort of evolution. I think we used to call uh, um, that procedure that was used to try to, to augment the vertebral body uh, with cement uh, vertebroplasty. And then we talked about maybe getting it uh, uh, that fracture a little bit better aligned before we actually fixed it and called that kyphoplasty. I think the term now that um, we're using is vertebral augmentation. Um, can you sort of give us a guide to how to understand the evolution over the last 30 years on how our thinking about these fractures has evolved and where, we are, where we're at now with that thinking? Yes. Um it was interesting, just uh, October 2nd of this year, they came out with uh, a very good uh, study they did where they, they studied people who had uh, uh, compression fractures that were already in the hospital and they performed the uh, vertebral, vertebral augmentation, either kyphoplasty or a, or a uh, vertebroplasty. They found that the people, and they followed these people for two years, that the people who had the vertebral augmentation or kyphoplasty, uh, including vertebroplasty, uh, they had much fewer complications. Uh, they had a, a much better two-year outcome. Uh, in fact, the uh, death rate was lower in people who had their compression fractures fixed. Uh, and so we didn't make them uh, live longer because of uh, a, fixing the compression fracture, uh, but because we fixed the compression fracture and it allowed the complications that go along with the pain and disability to not occur. Well, let's talk a little bit about those procedures and, and clarify for me because I, I, I know that this is something that has been uh, tried in various different ways. Are we talking about the same thing when we're talking about vertebroplasty and kyphoplasty and now vertebral augmentation? Should we just consider those one and the same, so to speak? In my opinion, the vertebroplasty and the kyphoplasty are very similar. Uh, it really depends a little bit on the, the skill of the, the physician performing the procedure and the equipment that he, he uses. And uh, I think uh, there are many different methods of doing this. Uh, and the vertebroplasty and the kyphoplasty, in my opinion, uh, are roughly equivalent. Uh, the kyphoplasty uh, has its advantages and perhaps some disadvantages, as well as the vertebroplasty uh, has advantages and some disadvantages. Uh, and so they're basically the same when we call them vertebral augmentation. And when you talk about vertebral augmentation, what are we exactly doing to the vertebral body uh, or that fracture that has occurred in the vertebral body. Can you describe for patients exactly what we're trying to accomplish when we do a procedure on that? 
what we're doing, you, you have a compressed uh, vert vertebral body and it's lost some height. Uh, and that's uh, noticeable on the x-ray, but what you're really trying to do is stop the uh, motion that's occurring at the fracture site. And so what we're trying to do is put some cement into that vertebral body to stop that micro motion. Uh, on occasion, we're able to increase the height back to closer to where the vertebral body height was in, before it broke. Uh, that's not always possible, uh, and it doesn't seem to make a difference uh, for the most part whether or not that height is restored. But what really makes a difference is have you got the motion stopped at that fracture site? Well, I think we actually have an animation of a device that you helped uh, design that we're probably going to uh, show patients now uh, to so that they have an understanding of how this works um, in the body itself, in the human body. So let, let's, let's run that and let, let the patients uh, see how one of these devices works. The Augmenta Vertebral Augmentation Device represents an evolution in the treatment of vertebral compression fractures. The device is placed into the vertebral body through a unipedicular approach. If necessary, an extrapedicular entry may be used. The Augmenta cannula incorporates a side-ported bone tamp that is used to create bone voids into areas of soft cancellous bone. The bone tamp can also be used as a probe to reduce the fracture fragments through gentle pressure on the outer cortical shell of the vertebral body. The surgeon uses a gentle tactile probing motion applied to the soft fractured cancellous bone combined with rotation of the cannula to change the direction of the side port exit. By varying the depth of the cannula in the vertebral body and using the directional port, the surgeon can direct the tamp into all quadrants of the vertebral body. Once created, these bone voids act as channels to direct the bone void filler of choice into the vertebral body. In this demonstration, polymethyl methacrylate cement is injected through the Augmenta cannula and directed into the bone voids by positioning the directional port. The precision void creation that is possible using the augmented device provides superior containment of the cement and minimizes the chance of extravasation. The precision voids created promote excellent interdigitation of the cement into the surrounding undisturbed bone stock, leading to stabilization of the fracture and reduction of further collapse of vertebral height. Well, I think that probably gives um, the, the patient some idea of what you're doing uh, when you actually insert one of these devices inside the vertebral body and then try to straighten up the vertebrae to some degree. And as we do that, we need to do something to prop that open. And that's where the cement uh, that was just shown in the animation comes in so that it really hardens very quickly. It's sort of an epoxy type cement and that hardens very quickly to sort of prop that vertebral body up as well as sort of solidify it together so it's, and I think you pointed out, it's no longer moving so the pain goes down. Um, anything else you want to say about that animation in terms of, of how that procedure is actually done from a surgeon's point of view? Well, the uh, animation doesn't, it shows us the uh, instrument that goes into the bone and, uh, and what it does and how the cement goes in to stop the motion and regain a, a little bit of the height. It doesn't show uh, that this is a percutaneous procedure. The patient uh, just has a single uh, skin incision about approximately um, half an inch long and that, that's the only skin incision they have. And, and uh, we usually do it under uh, sedation anesthesia. Uh, occasionally we do it under general and it can uh, be done as an outpatient, uh, it's sometimes done inpatient, and we have even got to where we do it in the office now. So this is something that is conceivably an office-based procedure that you could do in a private office where the patient wouldn't necessarily have to come into the hospital or a surgery center and simply come in in the morning and, and go home that afternoon 
with the procedure over and pretty much done with. That's right. Um, Medicare approved it to be an office procedure uh, last year, so we started uh, to perform the, the, uh, off the uh, operation in our office. Um, we typically have them come in at uh, noon, and they're usually home by uh, 2 o'clock. Well, that's quite exciting. I mean, this is uh, uh, something that, that can be done in the office, so that's, uh, that's, that seems like to me to be a huge uh, advance for this type of technique. People really like not having to go through the trouble of going to the hospital. The, the people that we do have to perform the service in the hospital are the people who we think are perhaps um, more at risk to have uh, uh, breathing complications or airway problems. And so uh, to do it in the office, you, you, you're going to have to be, you don't have to be in perfect health. You can uh, just be stable. But if you're having the severe breathing problems or other kind of problems, we, we do those in the hospital. And what's the follow-up uh, for this procedure? When you go home after, uh, at 2 o'clock, as you said, after the procedure, uh, what are you watching for over the next week or so? Sort of what's your activity level that first few days? Well, this is the uh, amazing thing about this procedure. 95% uh, of the time uh, when the patient uh, wakes up, either in the office or in the operating uh, at the hospital, the patient has no pain at all. And uh, we put no limitations on them afterwards. Uh, they do have a s small skin incision on their back. Uh, other than that, we put no limitations on them. Uh, when I first started to do these, uh, we did them all uh, on Saturday morning and they would stay and go home Sunday night. Uh, my partners would frequently uh, see these patients the next day and, and they were up walking around and they thought they were doing too good that uh, the patient, uh, why, did, why was this patient operated on because there's nothing wrong with them. But that was in the very beginning, 15 years ago, and we just didn't know how nice of an operation and how quick the response was. Uh, it's immediate response in most, in most cases. Uh, the people wake up uh, with no pain at all. And long-term sort of results with this, does this change the way that osteoporosis progresses or um, change anything about the spine that the patient should know about? It really does not. Uh, what it does is it prevents the complications of having a painful uh, compression fractures and studies have shown that the uh, patients do uh, much better when they have these fractures fixed than if they don't have them fixed. Uh, we aren't sure exactly why that is, but the pe people have better outcomes when these fractures are fixed. Well, just one point of clarification. I mean, we had mentioned that, that in the part of this discussion when people are having pain, one of the points of discussion is to say that this will most likely heal over six to eight weeks if you can just tolerate the pain until it heals. Is that accurate? Do these always heal or can they go on to continually cause pain until you actually have to do something about them? You're correct. Uh, we, we discussed that they can heal in six to eight weeks, but they don't always. They uh, can develop a pseudoarthrosis uh, they can be chronically painful. I, I've seen people who've uh, had these fractures and had pain in their backs for eight months uh, quite recently. And when I first started doing these, I, I met people who had these fractures that were painful for two or three years, uh, but they had, we had nothing to offer them until we started to do this procedure. And it was, it was very uh, rewarding to go in and uh, do a 15-minute uh, procedure and uh, have them uh, wake up completely pain-free when they've been hurting for two or three years. So, so if I hear you correctly, this is, this is something that doesn't necessarily have to be done on fresh fractures. It can be done on fractures that have occurred months before and are still failing to heal and still painful. Is that accurate? That's accurate. Well, let's talk a little bit about things that physicians sometimes don't like to talk about, especially surgeons, and that's potential complications. So when you, uh, as a surgeon, are evaluating patients and both during the procedure as well as after procedure, what are you worried about in terms of potential complications? The complications we're worried about is always we're, we're operating very near the spinal cord or the nerve roots or the, the sac that carries the nerve roots. Uh, 
And so we, we try to stay away from those structures, and we, we know how to do that as long as we have good bony landmarks. But unfortunately, in, in this group of people, there are not very good bony landmarks most of the times because they have severe osteoporosis. Uh, what we have to help us are we have, in, in my case, we, I use two different uh, x-ray machines, and we uh, quite frequently will have to turn the lights out in the room. And so we're, we're putting these uh, void creation devices uh, down using the x-ray machine. And I, I tell people that I, I worried about some type of injury to the nerves. I, I tell them that we're putting in a liquid cement, and this li liquid cement can go the wrong places. That's why we use a tamp to try to direct it to go into the places that we want it to go, and we're very careful to keep it far away from the places we don't want it to be. Uh, that and um, just the normal uh, fear of uh, a bad reaction to an anesthetic or sedation uh, is what we tell the patients what we're very worried about. But as I hear you uh, talking, this, this is a very manageable risk uh, in your opinion. Right. I've been fortunately not to have to see any of my own patients with this problem. Um, and I think it's because I've been doing the procedure so long and, and we use two, two x-ray machines. And uh, we're, we're very fortunate that, that I don't have to worry a great deal about this. And the people that do this procedure, it, um, it has a very low complication rate, uh, probably less than 2%. You know, this has been a fascinating discussion about the evolution of, of how we treat compression fractures in the spine, especially in the thoracic spine in patients with osteoporosis. Anything as we close this discussion that you feel patients need to know that we haven't discussed up to this point? I, I think that I'd, I'd just like to, to say that the patients, uh, uh, if they have a lot of pain and have uh, not re very responsive to pain medicines, they, they should consider the procedure. Uh, but if they are tolerating the pain, it's just a little achiness in their back, uh, it's a good chance that uh, they're going to be the person that heals up very well if they take the uh, right amount of vitamin D and calcium and let that heal up and uh, they don't have any, anything to really worry about uh, if they do have to have the procedure done. Well, I want to thank you for sharing this information for patients, and I, I look forward to following the progression of these new techniques into the future, and hopefully we can get you back on the show and, and talk a little bit more about uh, this and maybe some other spinal topics. So thank you very much. Randall, thank you.